Hi, welcome to today's Tech Talk. My name is Steve Souders. I work here at Google on web performance. Uh, and I call this set of Tech Talks Web Exponents, where we bring in people who are tech leaders uh, out in the web community to come in and share what they know. And today I'm uh, pleased to have Chris Anderson here talking about CouchDB. Uh, so quick bio. Uh, uh, Chris just relocated here from Portland down to Berkeley. Uh, so he's in the area now. And I said it would be awesome if you would come by Google and do a tech talk. So uh, he agreed to do that. He's a committer on Apache CouchDB. And he's working on an O'Reilly book that will come out soon. I think he's got, I see a, a subsequent slide here about it, CouchDB, The Definitive Guide. And uh, so he and I and uh, Doug Crockford are going to talk later about all the money we make on the royalties from our books, because tech books is such a huge industry. Um, and I have this one. Uh, oh, he's also director of Couch.io, uh, Couch.io. You can check that out. And he has this one uh, quote in his bio uh, about being obsessed with bending the physics of the web to give control back to the users. And so, you know, there's some uh, humor and, and uh, uh, perhaps exaggeration there, but not really. I remember first talking about performance and people said, well, you know, there's just the physics of the speed of light. There's not much we can do to make websites faster. And it turns out, you know, with smart engineering and some, you know, cool architecture, you can make a significant difference in the user experience. So um, I'm all about bending physics, too. So without any further ado, please help me welcome Chris Anderson. Uh, thanks for having me, Steve, and thanks for coming out to uh, hear about CouchDB. I really am interested in bending the physics of the web and, uh, you know, in more than just a performance way, but we'll talk about the performance of it, too. So uh, just to say a little bit about me, although Steve did a good job, um, I'm uh, jchris on Twitter if you want to get back to me that way. I'm working on the CouchDB Definitive Guide book. Um, I came into this whole working on databases world through uh, being a web developer. I used to do PHP, and then I got into Ruby on Rails. And then uh, I started using CouchDB in a project, and it made my life just so much easier. Um, so that, uh, that's how I got drawn into CouchDB. Um, so before we get started, uh, I've got some, uh, some questions for you all. Uh, so I guess you know some of these, the answer is going to be obvious. How many people here have built an application on top of a key value store instead of a relational database? All right, so a lot of times, uh, not so many hands go up. It depends on the environment you're working in. Um, and so uh, how many of you have written MapReduce uh, pro or functions? All right, yeah, not, not a stranger to MapReduce here. And then how many people here have worked in Erlang? All right, so that's the, um, that's the defining characteristic, I think, that, that, that makes Couch to be a little different um, from what you do at Google here, and uh, that's Erlang. But before we get started, we have to look at uh, the slogan of CouchDB, which is relax, and ask the, question, um, ask the question, why is that the slogan? And it really goes to the core of what we do in, uh, in CouchDB in a lot of ways. I think for me, the most important meaning of relax is that, uh, the, is that CouchDB should be easy to reason about. And so that means if you, you should be able to look at the API and have it make sense to you. You should be able to diagnose failure conditions in a simple way. Um, just generally, it shouldn't be surprising. Um, but then for users, you know, relax means relax. Your data is safe with us. Uh, we, we pride ourselves on having a very reliable storage engine. And uh, I'll talk more about that later. But reliability is, is our number one concern. We're, uh, we're not trying to build the Ferrari of databases. That's a, that's a popular sport these days. But uh, we're trying to build the Honda Accord of databases. And I think that's a little bit of a different sweet spot. Um, so uh, then the last meaning of relax, and I, this kind of this goes to the easy to reason about. Uh, but you know, when, we're, when we're debating in IRC among the developers how to implement a particular feature or what a particular query parameter should look like, uh, if you can say, well, well, this option is more relaxing, then you're probably going to win the argument. Um, so so uh, yeah, we're talking about CouchDB. The guy on my shirt is kicking back. I'm going to kick back. Now we can all relax. Um, so let's talk about the, the sea we're swimming in. Uh, Google's familiar with uh, the internet. It just keeps growing, right? There's like more internet all the time. Um, the, the curves are all up and to the right. Um, I've got so much internet here that I'm doing my IRC and checking my maps at the same time. 
And uh, you know, now I'm checking in code while I'm drinking a beer at the cafe. And uh, this guy has so much internet, he's got a camera strapped to his face. And uh, that's a prosthetic finger with CouchDB running in it. Uh, true story. And um, these guys have so much internet that it's, that it's on their heads. Um, they're overflowing with the internet. And I guess it's just going to be more and more like this. Uh, always more internet all the time, always faster, always more. And then, oh no, what happened? Um, you had so much internet, your router melted. And, uh, or you've got no bars because you're down there. And uh, these situations are getting to be you know, farther and farther uh, apart these days because there's more connectivity. But no matter what we do, no matter how much fiber we lay, uh, latency still sucks. And uh, the speed of light's not getting any faster. So the, um, you know, one way to, to fix this is to move the services closer to the users. And so that's, that's what I'm going to be talking about, uh, answering the question, what is CouchDB? So uh, you know, what is CouchDB? Is it a key value store with MapReduce? Yes. Um, is it an HTTP database written in Erlang? Yes. Um, but the real answer to what is CouchDB is it's a local web platform. And so uh, that means that it's designed around a use case where the application runs on your device um, or on your local network or in a browser plugin. Um, so you've, uh, you, you write your application and you just, just run it on, on whatever you've got close to the user. Uh, the reason we can do this is because we're designed from the ground up around offline replication. So it's a little similar to the Lotus Notes philosophy that uh, your data should be able to move with the users. Um, but the way we do our replication makes it uh, really easy to do offline work, to do ad hoc cluster topologies. You can uh, do real-time remote backups. It all just uh, becomes a simple primitive operation that you can trigger with um, an HTTP request. So we'll talk more about, about replication in a little bit. But uh, first about the implications of these, these local applications. Um, as opposed to cloud computing, we like to call it ground computing. Um, Jason Huggins is the first one that I heard say that in, in the CouchDB context. Um, but uh, this, is, this means you know, local to the user. It's a little bit more like the desktop than it is like Gears or HTML5 local storage. Although um, you know, we are talking about browser apps here. CouchDB is an HTTP server that runs on the end user's machine, that runs in the cloud. The applications don't care where they're being served from. And that allows you this really nice luxury when you're writing applications to be offline by default. Um, so how many people have started thinking about taking a web app and adding offline support using local storage or gears or whatnot? So you end up doing this thing where you've got your back end application that's got all kinds of whatever it does, and then your browser application and they're talking through a protocol. And that protocol probably doesn't mirror the protocol the browser application uses to talk to your local storage. So you end up with you know, even more of um, you know, these uh, impedance mismatches between your, your data store and your object model. Um, well, with, uh, with the CouchDB offline app, it's the same application. It doesn't matter whether it's being served from the server or being uh, served locally. Uh, and it's just a two-tier application. If, if you build your application so that it can be offline, then it's just going to be some stuff in the browser and CouchDB, and you're done. So um, there's, a, there's a quote I want to read um, from Jacob Kaplan Moss. And uh, this came out in October 2007 when I was first hearing about CouchDB. And it really kind of sent shivers down my spine and uh, you know, made sure that I went back. You know, maybe it took me another month before. I downloaded it, installed, and you know, tried it out a little bit. But um, I'll, I'll read the quote, and then I'll tell a little story about how it got that way. So uh, let me tell you something. Django may be built for the web, but CouchDB is built of the web. I've never seen software that so completely embraces the philosophies behind HTTP. This is what the software of the future looks like. And uh, you know, maybe that's a lot to say about you know, a little Erlang database thing that you know, runs in your browser, maybe. Um, but uh, the, it, it rang true for me, and you know, it rings true to other people who look into you know, and start building applications on CouchDB. Um, so when I was first talking to Damien, um, when I, I, I first met him, and was, uh, Damien Katz is the creator of CouchDB, and I was talking to him about the process he, he used to get to CouchDB, um, you know, I'd sort of had in, in my mind that uh, 
that it was discovered, not invented. And, and I said that, and he said, exactly. Um, I, was, I was programming around in the wilderness, um, you know, trying different things. I knew I wanted to build like a distributed file system or something, and you know, then it all started to fall into place, and, and I realized I was at the perfect spot. And, uh, and by the perfect spot, like, you know, there's, there's Couchbeat, it's got all this nice self-similarity that engineers really like to see when we look at the way things are implemented. Um, but, but the perfect spot, when, when I'm saying it here, means uh, it's a web server that serves up your data and uh, you know, makes it so that it's, it's very natural for that data to be replicated and to be transformed into views and into you know, HTML um, you know, renderings and, and whatnot. Uh, it's just, it makes everything that you have to do as a web developer more relaxing. So uh, hopefully, hopefully I'm not selling it too big right now, but uh, you, know, you can tell I believe in it at least. Um, so here's an example of how we're of the web. Uh, the CouchDB test suite is written in JavaScript and runs in the browser. This means that it's really easy for new contributors to get involved because everybody knows enough JavaScript to write a test case. Um, but that's not, you know, that's not all in, that that makes this, you know, in my opinion, uh, better suited for testing CouchDB than say some some unit tests that you know run in the development environment. And uh, one of them is that you can validate your installation. So if you, uh, if you run CouchDB behind a proxy or behind a series of proxies, then you run the unit tests in the local browser and you know whether or not you're getting end-to-end -end, uh, acceptance and you know, maybe just one request is, is breaking or one feature is not working. Um, and that becomes uh, immediately apparent. Um, but even more so, uh, you know, me with these grandiose visions up here, uh, I'd like to see CouchDB as a protocol. And in order for that to happen, there need to be other implementations. So uh, you know, if you're out there and you want to hack up a quick Ruby script that passes these tests, uh, you know, please do. It would be you know, it's that, that satisfying feeling of, of getting to green over and over again until you get all your, all your tests passing. So um, that's about it for the standard elevator pitch. But I put in, um, I put in some elevator pitch for Google. Uh, because I know that Google has a, um, an interest in bringing up new developers and making sure that, that people outside the organization understand MapReduce and understand how to build scalable web applications. And uh, CouchDB is you know, a, great, um, it's a great first step into the programming model that you have to use at scale. Um, so you end up modeling your, your, um, your reads and writes around concurrency. Um, uh, because we have multi-version concurrency control, you want to avoid um, you know, people stepping on each other's uh, edits and uh, everything that CouchDB mm -hmm. outputs has e tags and it's cacheable, and so that means that it introduces people to uh, the idea of, of pure functional transforms from their data to uh, user interface. Um, and then eventual eventual consistency. You can't run anything at scale without the idea that you know a save might take some time to replicate, uh, you know, to become globally accepted by the system. So, uh, document modeling is uh, the, uh, the, the unit of, of, of a, a key in CouchDB is a document, uh, which has a multi-version concurrency control. And uh, that's, every time you save a document, you need to, um, you need to return the, the rev token that you had last time, or you had when it loaded. Otherwise, um, if there's a Mitch master on the server, then you get, uh, then you get a precondition failed error and an update conflict. And so you end up modeling around concurrency. There's a, um, there's a couple of patterns that I'll talk about later that, uh, that make sure that users don't stomp on each other's edits and, and that really um, make sure that developers understand the difference between an edit a user makes and an edit that, uh, that a machine makes. So uh, if, if you have people coming in who know how to write CouchDB applications, they're going to be that much closer to to being, uh, you know, ready to get their hands dirty at Google. So let's let's get technical. Let's talk about um, the actual CouchDB APIs and uh, and the storage engine and whatnot. Um, but b before I get started on that, um, does anybody know what this is? Anyone rec recognize it? Cool. Uh, we got one. It's, it's the it's the clock of the long now. Um, it's the it's the orary, which is the, the gear set designed for keeping time for ten thousand years. Um, so the idea that something could be that robust is is really inspiring to me. Um, I don't know if our if our data file format is that robust, but 
Um, you know, we want it to be as robust as possible. There's Robust Kitty. Um, robust Kitty says, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to corrupt your data. Um, so, what makes the file format robust? It's an append-only file. So that means that once bytes are written to the disk, we never touch them again. Um, you know, it's, it's like it's journaling all the time. Um, it's an append-only B tree. So uh, the the big um, the big win we get out of this is that if there's a crash, there there's no fix-up phase. Um, there's a, it's always consistent on disk. So CouchDB was inspired by um, some computer science papers that Damien Katz found, um, you know, while doing his research, uh, that you know tested a crash-only design versus a design where there's a shutdown command for your application. Uh, so CouchDB has no shutdown command. To stop a CouchDB node, you just kill dash nine it, and that's as, that's as good as any other way to stop it. Um, so. Uh, crash only design really you know it means that you're not going to be sitting there waiting for a weekend while your my isam table rebuilds or you know whatever sort of things that um, that, that we don't really like thinking about um, now one of the side effects one of the benefits of having this append only file structure is that we are uh, we very rarely seek the disk head and so you get some nice performance um, some nice performance wins out of it this is a benchmark that Inda Farrell at the BBC did. They were doing a shootout among key value stores to um, decide which one to use for their new backend infrastructure. They're, uh, now they've moved into production and they're slowly replacing parts of their infrastructure with CouchDB. Um, but at the, you know, sort of the final phase, it was CouchDB versus MemcacheDB. And uh, the, uh, you can see right here at the beginning that MemcacheDB is way faster than CouchDB for, um, for accepting rights until you get outside of the working set. Um, this benchmark goes on for two days. Um, you have to look at the slides up close because the reader and the writer transactions per second are on different scales. But, but generally, uh, CouchDB you know, starts out basically the speed of your disk, and then you get that expected order login performance as the B tree gets larger. But they were, they were really happy with this. Um, they now have it running on. Uh, on a cluster in uh, two data centers with automatic failover. And uh, the, the thing that Enda said that you know, really made me feel like uh, well, this is a real deal, uh, when, when Britain is burning, everyone turns to the BBC. And if you're the ops guy for the BBC, you probably can't get to work that day. And so they really needed something reliable, something they could trust. And uh, so it it's, makes me happy that, that they went with CouchDB. Um, so, that's, that's the file format. Really, you know, to be the Honda Accord of databases, you need to not have to go to the shop that often. And, uh, and, and that's why, you know, we chose to design it like this. Um, so JSON documents, I assume everyone here is familiar with JSON. Um, sorry about the typeface, it doesn't have lowercase letters, so imagine some of those are lowercase letters. Um, but uh, CouchDB just stores every document as, uh, at the JSON object, um, there are two required keys in a CouchDB document. There's the ID and the rev. The rev I already talked about. It's the multi-version concurrency control token. Um, it it ensures that whoever saves first wins. You, know, you never get um, you never save on top of somebody else's work by surprise. Um, the ID then is uh, it's unique within a database, which each database is a flat namespace, and it determines the URL. So if the um, if this database was called, um, you know, Star Wars, then the idea of this document would be Star Wars slash BC4 EA blah blah. Um, we use UUIDs by default so that we don't have to check for existence of the ID before, um, you know, before doing a write. We can just assume that there's not going to be a collision. Uh, thank goodness for uh, probability, right? So. Uh, you know, UUIDs do have a little bit of a cost in terms of storage space, but uh, we're more interested in reliability and being easy to reason about than, than you know, shaving every last byte off of every request. Um, now, there's, uh, there's one thing about this, uh, about using these JSON documents that are schemaless. If someone can just go and change dark side to more calbo, and, uh, you know, it's still a JSON document. It's still valid as far as, as, far as CouchDB is concerned. Um, I should, uh, I should mention now that there are validation functions that 
run in the server, um, written in JavaScript, that can you know, require, for instance, that dark side must be a Boolean value. Um, so there's, a, a, you know, there's some, some good sides and some bad sides that come with, uh, with a schema-free design. I think the good side uh, is that it's flexible in that you can evolve your data with your application. As you add a new feature, you don't have to go do a modify table to add a bunch of stuff to the, um, you know, to the old data that's already been recorded. You can just account for it in your application with if statements or whatever, as you would have to do anyway. Um, but I think the bigger win for, uh, for a schema-free document model over the relational model, at least, for me personally, is that when I go back in to dig into an application that's you know, been in maintenance mode or whatever, um, it's a lot easier for me to bootstrap the, um, the application model up in my head when it's a document. Because you just get the document and you look at it and it makes sense. Um, and if you, uh, but with the relational model, you have to you know, figure out what query do I run to pull sense out of this database. Um, and you know, so then you have this whole other thing you have to bootstrap up in your head before you even have the application. Um, so I think it's a little simpler, a little more relaxing for developer productivity too. Um, so you know, one, one side effect of having the flexible schema is that you end up having to duct type things a lot. Um, so I, I put in a duck, everybody likes a duck. Um, so you'll duct type things in, in your MapReduce functions um, or in your application. So uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about CouchDB's MapReduce implementation. Uh, it's a little different as far as I know. I haven't, I haven't had the pleasure of working on the Google MapReduce. But uh, as far as I know, we're the, we're the only incremental MapReduce store out there. So what this means is that you write your MapReduce functions, and they're computed over your database initially. And then as new edits come into the database, the index is brought up to date to um, to reflect those new edits, and it's uh, um, you know it's all transparent to the user, and it's all you know optimized. There's, you're not paying additional cost to to rebuild the entire index every time, so it, it allows you to do uh, MapReduce indexes that are that are online that you know are consistent with your uh, initial data set. The other thing that is the um, you know sort of falls out of doing uh, MapReduce incrementally is that the reduce queries can be run across dynamic ranges. So if you have a reduce that, say, counts the number of um, you know, blog posts in a given date range, then if you do uh, the reduce with no start key and end key, you'll get the count of all the blog posts in the entire database. And if you do a start key at the beginning of the month and the end key at the end of the month, then you have the count of blog posts that are within that month. Um, you can also do group queries, which is essentially um, you know, it scans through the index and uh, breaks it up according to um, the, if your key is an array, the elements of the array. So essentially, you could get, you could have one index that would tell you how many blog posts there were in all of 2008, and that same index could tell you for each month in 2008, for each day in each month, and, you know, whatever granularity um, you choose without, uh, you know, without having to build multiple indexes and with an order log in query time for for each query. Um, so our, uh, our MapReduce functions are also written in JavaScript. This makes it really easy to get started, but also um, it makes it you know, really fun to, to program. And there's no better language for manipulating JSON than JavaScript. So uh, I, think, I think that that's, that's at least pretty obvious. I don't know. Some languages come close, but, uh, but I really think that you know, the, native, the native language is the one to use. Um, so this is a, this is some, a snapshot um, from, from Ricky Ho's blog post on the CouchDB implementation of the way that the indexes are stored. And I just want to go up and gesticulate at that a little bit uh, so that people can get an idea of what's happening under the covers there. So this is, this is a logical view of the bean tree. Um, the values here are essentially the, what's emitted by the map. Um, and the, the keys there are also the keys emitted by the map up in, the, uh, up in that second layer. And then for each B tree block, uh, for, all the, for all the intermediate nodes in the B tree, the reduction value is stored. So if your reduce is a row count, then you would just store the number of rows that that block has below it. Um, if your reduction value is the standard deviation of the values that the map emitted, then you would store that standard deviation there um, in, the, in the intermediate reduction value. 
And that's what allows us to go in and uh, query for dynamic reduced ranges and get the, you know, get the correct result back, if you write your function properly, uh, to, uh, and to do that without you know, the massive cost of, of actually loading up all those key value pairs and running the reduction across it. We can use the intermediate values when possible, and when you're sort of at the edge of the range, then you might have to go down and grab a few key value pairs uh, from the data set to, to roll into the reduce. Uh, this means that your reduce functions have to be um, commutative and associative, but uh, most of them are anyway. So um, this here is a picture, sort of a representation of the of the on disk format. Uh, so what what happens is uh, essentially, let's say we're we're changing p six here or p uh, six here. So what we do is uh, we seek back into the file, find P6, um, you know, load the logical representation of the B tree up into memory. And then when we go to commit that edit, we commit, first we write uh, the key value pair, then we write the, um, you know, the intermediate node that points to it. And then we rewrite any, any intermediate nodes that may have, um, you know, that point to that node, um, all the way back up. So the last thing we write every time we commit data is the B tree root. So uh, you know, there's there's an additional cost in terms of recorded data, but uh, generally, it means that uh, that you get an order log in cost for for updates, and uh, and you're going ahead and rewriting all that stuff anyway for reliability. So you may as well record the new reduction values while you're doing it. Um, the the view indexes use the same um, use the same file format as the database. So anything you learn about uh, the view indexes applies to the database as well. So that's the MapReduce views. Uh, does anybody have any questions on that? Okay. Um, so uh, let's talk about HTTP. The uh, CouchDB has an HTTP interface. It's restful, as you know, as far as we can make it without getting too pedantic. And uh, the um, you know the hallmarks of it are that you get a document from its URL. Uh, you can post to a database to create a new document if you don't care what ID it gets. Um, you can delete a document as URL, and then you can put to a URL to create or update a document. If, you, if you're creating a document, you already know what the ID is, then you put it there. If you're updating a document, then you put it back where you found it. Um, we did a, a bunch of you know, sort of interesting work to make sure that put is item potent, even in a cluster. Um, and th that's sort of interesting. I can talk about that later, um, but we really take being restful seriously because it makes it easier to reason about. Um, it also means that we can leverage 15 years of tools that have been built in, you know, ever since the web started. So you can put CouchDB behind Squid or behind Apache. Um, you can, uh, you know, monitor it using regular HTTP monitoring tools. If your ops team knows how to scale your, your web tier, then now they can scale your database tier using the same technologies. Um, now, this also means that, that it's uh, mash upable or remixable the way that uh, you know, normal web stuff is. Um, and one really great example of that is a project called CouchDB Lounge, which was originally written by Amiibo um, to build a CouchDB cluster. Because all, all the stuff I've been talking about, um, CouchDB is designed to run on a single node. But it's designed uh, always keeping in mind that the API that it presents shouldn't have to look any different if it runs on a cluster. Um, and so this was all you know, in our heads um, and you know, on the developer mailing list. Uh, we talked about what would the architecture look like? We knew eventually we wanted to um, you know, have a cluster capable version of CouchDB. Um, what would the architecture look like? You know, now we've got it kind of planned. Now it's going to take all summer to build it in Erlang. And, uh, and the next thing that happened was Mebo came along and built something that used the same architecture. Um, using an Nginx, um, you know, C plugin and some Twisted Python, so they're just using Nginx to do the consistent hashing, and then the Twisted Python to merge the view queries. So it uses a um, scatter gather architecture for the for the view queries. Um, but uh, the the cool thing about it is you run this CouchDB lounge, you put it in front of you know however many nodes. Um, I think that uh, Mebo is running it on a 64 logical nodes um, sharded on to like 12 boxes or something right now. Um, but you get it deployed like that, and then you run that, that JavaScript test suite that I showed earlier, and it just passes. So uh, 
You know, what's cool about that is like now all of a sudden those node, those, those lounges are just couch DBs. And if you get in a pinch where you need to grow your cluster, well, you can just make a lounge of lounges and uh, have, have uh, fractal scaling. I mean, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's not news that that's the way you would scale something like this, but it's, it's really cool that you can do it all in the HTTP domain. Um, and, and the fact that we've got e tags um, on everything allows you to have some of the intermediate nodes in the tree do caching and uh, you know, keep the latency down even if the tree gets kind of deep. So uh, the backbone of all of this is replication. And uh, I should talk a little bit about replication. So, so you've got a couch. Like, no big deal. You've got some data in it. Um, now you've got two couches. And you want to you wanna bring them into sync. So you just post this JSON um, object at one of the couches and say, replicate from remote DB to local DB. And it's done. Um, any changes that have happened on the remote DB since, um, you know, since the last time you replicated get pushed over. And uh, if you do it again, then only whatever changes happen since then get pushed over. So uh, there's actually two modes. This is triggered mode, where it just does a push of the changes. There's also continuous mode, where uh, the, um, the target DB, or rather the replicator, subscribes to a comet feed of the source DB and waits for update events to come through the comet feed, and then pushes those update events into the target DB. And so this allows you to do a bunch of fun topologies. Um, you could do the real standard uh, master-slave load balancing thing uh, that you can do with MySQL or whatever, where you just ship all the, have all the writes go here. So put a proxy in place um, that, uh, that sends all the gets over here and sends everything else to this couch, and then just get replication happening. And when you've done that, then uh, you can put a load balancer across it all, and, uh, and you've got you know, you can scale your read requests. Um, the nice thing about it, though, is that because of the way that, uh, that we maintain the indexes for replication, it can be bidirectional. It can be ad hoc in, in all sorts of whatever ways you want to do. So uh, you can, now you've got uh, multi-master. And two masters is, you know, that's, that's doable in a MySQL installation. Three masters is a little bit harder. Um, and then, you know, when you start talking about in master, then now how you have to have you know somebody who's who's managing the um, you know the global uh, agreement about IDs and whatnot. Um, so for us, we don't have to worry about that because of UUIDs. So we just have all the masters we want. Uh, we're eventually consistent. If you load balance this, then uh, if one couch falls over, your load balancer drops it out of rotation. The users are none the wiser. Um, you can also do some useful things like this. Uh, imagine these are transatlantic cables here. This is uh, the front end for your, um, for your East Coast users, and those are your, your London users or your UK users. And then you know, this is an offline backup that you use for reporting jobs or whatnot, and you have another one um, in Europe. And so you could set that up pretty easily. If any of those links falls down, all the individual CouchDBs are still useful. Um, and if the link comes back up, they bring themselves back up to date. So what I get interested in is this topology, where everything's a couch, and couches are everywhere. And, uh, and this is my laptop, and this is the computer at work, and this is my phone, and uh, they're all replicating around my contacts database. And you know, every time I make a change on my phone, it goes to work, and it goes to the other people in my work group's contact list. Um, so you know, you've got to write the application to do that. Couch to be able to just make sure the data gets shipped around. But I already talked a little bit about how writing the applications is simple. Um, so one thing, you know, one thing to think about is that since each CouchDB database is a single flat namespace um, of documents usually named by UUIDs, after everything's replicated, you know, it, it, in the fullness of time, there is only one CouchDB because it all just you know, comes together. Um, but you know, that's assuming that everyone replicates with everyone. So. Uh, we'll have to wait for that one. Um, so now there's, uh, there's some conventions you have to follow if you want to get that offline mode for free stuff. Um, and the simplest thing is that your application itself is packaged up inside a CouchDB document. So you've got a document. And CouchDB recognizes this document's special. It's a design document. It contains an application. And it unfurls it into a wonderful, uh, beautiful running application. Uh, you know. Uh, with the flower icon there. 
Um, and so once your applications are documents, then they just replicate like other data. And it makes, um, you know, makes sort of a whole new way of deploying stuff possible. Um, but, but can this actually you know, be done? Um, is, is, is this practical? So we've got to scale down. We need CouchDB to be running at the edge. And um, it's, not, you know, it's not super easy. Erlang's on our side with this one. So I checked, um, I checked last night. And even running the test suite, which is like doing things like triggering replication over and over again and causing crashes on purpose and whatnot, um, you know, so, so sort of abusing a CouchDB, the memory usage stays below 20 megabytes which I think is pretty fair for a database. It used to be smaller, um, but we're faster now. So uh, that may be one of those, one of those classic trade-offs. Um, I've, I've heard rumors of CouchDB, of, of Erlang and Couch running on the ARM processor. Uh, this is definitely CouchDB running on the OLPC. And uh, there is a couch that runs CouchDB um, that uh, you know, uses it to store user profiles. So, so think about a couch with user profiles. It's actually it's a robotic massage couch, and it massages you according to your last FM listening history. So um, there's you can do all sorts of things with it. Um, but maybe getting Erlang, you know, into a tiny footprint isn't enough because uh, you know certain you know there's politics and whatever people want to run their stuff in C or or you know accepted environments. So uh, Atul Varma uh, wrote this started this project called Browser Couch which allows you to um, have a couch that runs in your browser as part of the web page. It's just a JavaScript library. It uses local storage or whatever is available in a local browser and replicates with CouchDB. Um, it's not done by any stretch of the imagination, but the important parts are started. And uh, you know, the idea is that you can write couch apps that don't even um, and they don't even need a real CouchDB, but they can still be full-fledged Couch apps and, and replicate to the user's computer and whatnot. So this gets me to the thing that I'm really excited about, which is giving control back to users. Because when the application lives on the user's machine with the source code and everything right there, then they can just flip it over, change it, make it fit their needs better, share it with their friends. Um, I mean, you know, if you ever see a kid program, it doesn't make any sense what they do. You know, they write like the craziest stuff. I mean, that's what I did. And, um, and it works for them. I mean, like a program that's you know sort of like half broken and crazy, but is your program, is a lot better than uh, you know a perfect program that's for grown-ups, or a perfect program that is for you know inventory at an organization that's not your organization. Um, so if you have you know your little inventory program for running in-house or or whatever um, that really is yours, then you know how to change it. You know how to um, customize it. You know how to personalize it. Um, I think. You know, programming is empowering, and it's empowering for two reasons. One is that you can make something awesome and share it without really asking permission. Um, but the real reason, the thing that got me into it was being able to personalize stuff, being able to take applications that I was using and, you know, make them a little bit more mine. Um, I really, you know, I, I, I'm not so much trying to, like, make a tool for teaching kids how to program. I just want to make an environment where kids get in trouble for programming too much. Um, because, you know, that, that's, how, that's when it really gets good. Um, so, so that's enough of the of my sort of ideology of of, of wanting to you know empower users, um, but uh, I think it's it's really an important point, and it's what got me into CouchDB, um, you know, in a serious way. So, who's using it? So, I talked earlier about the BBC and Mebo. Um, there's a few startups using it. Mozilla's really into CouchDB. Um, IBM employs Damien Katz full time, um, and uh, this is. You know, far from a complete list. Uh, there are also um, a bunch of these little couch apps, a bunch of applications that run on a standalone CouchDB. So you know, we've got uh, a um, sort of gallery of processing JS sketches. We've got a real-time shared groupware calendar. Uh, we've got a Twitter client that lets you do uh, word clouds of you know, the popularity of words that people say based on the, the archive of what they've said. Um, you know, one of the other CouchDB committers, uh, Jason Davies, even switched out the, um, one, of his, one of his consulting clients' websites from a Django app, I think, into CouchDB uh, as a standalone app with just a little bit of a rewrite proxy in front to make the URLs pretty. And uh, 
it literally didn't look any different. N no one could tell the difference, except for he did that as an experiment to make sure that you can make anything in it. Um, there's a bunch more here. There's you know a few instances of this blog software that I wrote. Um, there's an, a couple of online presentation things and a delicious style link aggregator, um, as well as as a personal site for for Jason's wedding. Um, so. That's all good, but what's really exciting, what makes me think that uh, this vision is not just like some, some crazy people out on the side saying, you know, we can make the web different and, and you know, give people more power, um, is Canonical is including CouchDB as a default system service in Ubuntu Karmic, which is out shortly. Um, and they're using it to solve the data island problem so that your contacts and your bookmarks and, you know, whatever data, um, your emails, on, on your machine at work and your machine at home and, you know, uh, your phone um, or even on a web terminal at the library. Uh, all that stuff has access to the same data and they're making it really user friendly. Uh, it's packaged up in the Ubuntu One service but um, there's also just a CouchDB that you can log into on your local box and uh, start writing applications. They're encouraging the new application developers to start using CouchDB as a, um, where you might otherwise have used SQLite or a flat file format in the past, because then the data is portable. Um, and they're, they're doing the hard work of even, you know, syncing contacts with old school phones, uh, you know, going through a proprietary service or whatever it is they have to do in order to make that happen. So you can write a CouchDB application to manage the contacts on the free phone that you got in, you know, 2003. Um, and, and that's really exciting. That makes me think that, um, it, it's actually happening. Um, so we can do all these things, um, and it gives us a certain amount of freedom. Uh, but but we don't have to we don't have to go all the way with the you know apps at the edge. Um, those most of those couch apps that I showed live at URLs. They're a normal server. Um, this is good because people are used to it. You give somebody a URL, they go to it. They know how that works. Um, now, one of the downfalls of the you know centralized server architecture is that when your um, when your site gets popular, everybody hits it at once, and users want things to be fast. You know, they they care about that that low latency, and as the traffic starts to back up, some people start refreshing, and it just snowballs and gets worse. Um, you know, this is what happens. Uh, the the dig effect, I guess, is what we call it these days. Um, and so you've got this one server in a in a known location trying to serve all this traffic and latency is the, the important factor there. Um, but when you take that same Couch app and the user has a um, browser plugin for CouchDB or is running it on Ubuntu and can go into offline mode, then they're browsing against the local copy of the data and the latency is not an issue, it's just fast. Um, it's also reliable, if the internet goes down, they won't notice right away. Um, and now if you, uh, if you're serving one of these applications, if you run the mothership, uh, it's also nice because you get to tune for throughput. Um, and that's simpler than tuning for latency. You don't have to make sure that every request gets, res gets responded to right away. You can just fill that pipe as full as you can. Um, and so if people are, if, if your HTTP requests are replication requests and it takes a second or two for that replication to get up to full speed, it's not a big deal. Um, and then you can just you know, fill the pipe until the replication is done. The users are seeing low latency responses the whole time. Um, one thing that's worth noting here is this really plays to the strengths of mobile connections because a mobile connection is fast enough to stream video but it takes two seconds to get started. So if you're using, if you're making local requests but uh, then doing your data synchronization um, over, over the network, the latency on the data synchronization isn't as important and it allows you to have fast, powerful apps, um, you know, run from some big data center somewhere but where the user experience is really slick. So if we take this one step farther and you take one of those offline, offline apps and replicate it back up to another cloud host or um, you know, stick it on a USB drive and take it to your friend's house, now we're talking about the peer-to-peer -peer web, um, which, which is what got me all excited. Um, and uh, I think that the, the important thing here is that it makes the applications independent um, in, in sort of the Lawrence Lessig sense, that the application answers to the user, um, not, to the, not to the server it's hosted on. And so you end up, uh, you know, probably not only just sort of the obvious things like, oh, I can add a feature that I need that nobody else needs, um, the standard open source 
uh, scratching your own itch stuff, but the idea that um, uh, users come to expect that applications respect their time and attention, and they're not going to like click them through a bunch of extra pages that they don't want to see um, just to show ads or whatnot. So I, I think that uh, I think this is sort of a, a lower energy state um, because you're using the network more efficiently. Um, users see things as faster, and it gives them more control. So um, whether or not it's CouchDB that's the answer to the question, I, I think that this direction is is an inevitable one, um, and it ends up looking a little bit, you know, a little bit like the desktop, but connected. Back in the desktop days, everything was an island. Um, now we have these applications that we control, but but they're connected to the web and to all the data that's out there. Um, so, what does it feel like to be a user in one of these applications? Um, it, it feels like messaging um, because you drop your your message into the replication mesh and maybe it goes through a bunch of hops and whatnot, but you know eventually it gets where it's going and eventually you get the messages that are bound uh, for you. But the um, you know there's a couple of problems here. One of them is in a big replication mesh. Maybe you can't trust the intermediate servers, um, so you could try to do something with certificate authorities and whatnot. But um, you know the uh, Sort of the closer to the to the shape of the problem solution is key-based identity, and and a web of trust solution, um, and so even if you don't trust all the servers between uh, you know the place where your message originated, and uh, the place where you're reading it, if the message is cryptographically signed by a key that you accept, then you don't have to worry about those intermediate servers. Um, so you end up uh, you know with a whole key-based identity based around that, like I signed to this message, um, you know, he signed to that message, it, it makes it, um, I, think, I think it's actually a simpler metaphor for users than like I'm Jay Chris on Twitter. Um, the idea that this message came from, from the originator. Uh, there hasn't been really a solution that, that users were happy about because um, I think the reason why is that the people who write these interfaces are all, you know, crypto freaks and not necessarily the most, you know, sort of attuned to the fact that computers can be hard to use. Um, but I think that if, if we don't try and go for, you know, complete and total security, but rather, you know, secure enough, secure enough for informal messages, not, you know, secure enough for, um, you know, legally binding contracts. Um, if, we, if we go for an informal, uh, you know, key-based identity, I think that it shouldn't be hard to have uh, have a user interface and workflow and whatnot that that makes that uh, intuitive to users. So that's that's the story of where I think all this stuff could take us, um, you know, in the next five or ten years. Um, and when I tell this story, I get uh, I get an interesting reaction that I don't expect sometimes from you know from old school web heads, and that's that this is obvious. They, they'd sort of seen the architecture, you know, the, back in the day, the web was really um, Amenable to new users coming along. Oh, just just stick your HTML up. Um, you know, it's got your your physics problems in it or whatever, um, and that's easy. But you know, over time, as users' expectations for applications have gone from just uh, you know a list of my favorite jokes to like you know an interactive joke ranking site, uh, these kinds of uh, server-based applications have gotten to have a higher barrier of entry. And I think you know bringing that barrier of entry back down is uh, sort of returning the web to its roots and, and hopefully making it you know, a, a more exciting place to be. Um, a lot of the data that, that it makes sense to put into uh, a peer style couch app is personal data. Um, you know, personal like sort of in the sense that I'm not trying to publish this to the world. This is just the pictures from you know, last week's party and I want to show them to my friends and the easiest way to do that is to you know, just replicate them to, to their copy of the picture reading app. And we don't have to worry about, you know, the permissions settings on um, our social networking site, making sure that, that they only go to the right people. You just only give them to the right people. Um, and so it makes, it makes data interchange a lot, more, uh, a lot more like real world use of data. Like I hand you a folder full of stuff. Um, so I think, I think that this is all, it becomes, you know, sort of intuitive, um, and, uh, and, and fun for, for users um, sort of got, got some high, uh, highfalutin you know, ideas, but, but the idea uh, when you come down to it and actually use it is it, it's really not a big deal. Um, so I'm ready to take questions.
Yeah. So the, the REST API on this, there are some things in REST that aren't as efficient, especially if your couch is a long ways off. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say, deleting 100 items or updating 100 records or something. Uh, how, do you, how do you handle that with the couch? So the question is, uh, if you're going to be doing lots of you know, lots of quick transactions in succession, uh, is there a way to make it more efficient uh, with CouchDB? And yeah, you really, if you're, if you're doing any kind of um, you know, batch operations, then you should be using the bulk API. So it allows you to post an array of operations, essentially, at CouchDB. Um, there's really just one kind of thing. It's an update. And so some of the updates can be deletes. Some of the updates can be creating a new document. Some of the updates can be changing existing documents. So you just post this big, uh, this big batch to CouchDB, and it does the work. Um, you can benchmark it. It depends on the size of your data. But you should start out by thinking about batches of roughly 1,000 at a time. And the batches also. Um, Oh, no, I'm saying uh, if you have like 100,000 records to put in, stick them in between like 1,000 and 5,000 at a time. Um, if you, and there's some, uh, there's some other performance hints that you can give CouchDB. Um, you can tell CouchDB it's allowed to build its own batch on the server, which doesn't help with the HTTP overhead, but it does make the files more compact because you end up rewriting the, the B tree routes less often, um, and you'll get higher throughput. And the difference can be kind of astounding. Um, in terms of performance, if you just do the single key value, you know, gets and puts and deletes, um, versus doing, you know, optimizing the batches for your application, it can be like two or three orders of magnitude difference in performance. So it's if you if it looks too slow, if you the whole this couch to be too slow, then you're probably not using it like um, like it should be for your application. So it, this is very exciting, thought-provoking, motivating. So people watching the video want to jump on the bandwagon. Can you tell them you know, what are the three things, the first three things you have to do to get uh, on top of programming with CouchDB? Like going to a website, downloading stuff, signing up for a Couch Cloud somewhere. What is it? Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, I've got a slide with some links, but they aren't the first links that come to mind. Uh, so probably the easiest way to get started if you're on the Mac is with a program called CouchDBX. It's just CouchDBX, one word. If you, if you Google for that, you'll find um, it's a, it's a one-click installer. And it just runs as an application. with It keeps its data inside the application bundle. It's very clean. It has all the dependencies with it. Um, so that's the easiest way to get started with a local CouchDB on the Mac. If you're on Ubuntu, um, then it's already on your Karmic. Um, if you're on Windows, it's, it's not such an easy story, although uh, CouchDB 11 and Trunk is starting to have official support. Um, we're definitely going to have a Windows version of CouchDB for the, um, you know, by the end of the year in a release. Um, so that's how to get it. Um, you could also go to hosting.couch.io, and hopefully other services will crop up offering hosted CouchDB instances. Um, and if you don't want to run it locally, you can run one in the cloud. And aside from the network latency, it won't be any different. Um, let's see. The, uh, if you want to get started reading um, the technical overview at the website that's on the screen now, couchdb.apache.org, or the, uh, the CouchDB book, the one I'm writing, is available for free online. Uh, we're giving it away under uh, a liberal license. So go in there. You know, translate it to whatever language you want, read it, learn about CouchDB. Uh, it's books.couchdb.org. And there's also a Manning book um, and some other books coming out, so you can always go get books. Uh, with your uh, multi-master replication, one of the, uh, the challenges of that is, is how to uh, deal with concurrent updates on different replicas. What, what are the semantics that you have for that, and is there any ways for apps to customize that? Um, okay, so the question is, uh, if we have uh, if we have two couches, we got couch A and couch B, and uh, the same key is updated at the same time on both of those couches, then they can't reject the update for being um, for being out of date because they both you know have the original version on here. So now you've got two conflicting versions of the document. You replicate those couches together. What you know? What's the answer? How do we how do we handle that? Um, and, and that's, a, that's a great question. Um, 
So the, uh, and I actually have slides for it because it's such a great question. <laughs> so um, what we do is, uh, let's just set up the scenario. So I make this document, I replicate it. Now I've got the document in two places. I edit it in one place. Now I edit it in the other place. So now I've got the two conflicting versions of the same document. Um, what happens when I replicate? Well, all that happens there is that we keep both versions. It's really the simplest answer. Um, that, that, you know, we don't want to be deciding for your application how we resolve conflicts. We, what we do is we keep all the conflict heads. We maintain, each document maintains a tree of revisions and uh, we keep all the conflict heads around until the conflict is resolved. Um, when the conflict is resolved by an edit on, on any node that has knowledge of the conflict, then that conflict resolution is also replicated. So, uh, you know, it's, it, we basically punt on it, but we punt on it in a way that gives applications the flexibility to do what they want. So, for instance, the BBC just has a, um, a little bot that watches the, the event stream on their cluster, and when it sees a conflict occur, it resolves it to say whoever saves last wins because they figure the more recent data is better. Um, but it's up to your application. You, uh, the default, which conflict shows up in views and whatnot, uh, it's going to be a consistent across the cluster. So if you introduce a conflict on that big replication mesh picture I have, eventually after all the couches replicate, they'll have the same uh, winning conflict by default. But the algorithm for doing that is just the easiest one we could come up with that was deterministic. So whichever conflict has the longest edit history is the one that wins. Um, but the, the other conflicts stay around until the conflict itself is resolved. So Chris, we're running out of time. Uh, are you going to be able to stay for lunch? Yeah. So anyone who has more questions, if you want to uh, come up after or uh, join us for lunch, that would be great. Chris, I wanted to present you with the official Google Tech Talk uh, bag of swag. Sweet. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so thanks very much for coming today, telling us about CouchDB. How about a round of applause? Where's lunch? <laughs>